Idamin Dada, slash Idamin slash, c. 1925, the 16th of August 2003, was the third president of Uganda, ruling from 1971 to 1979. Amin joined the British colonial regiment, the King's African Rifles in 1946, serving in Kenya and Uganda. Eventually, Amin held the rank of Major General in the post-colonial Ugandan army and became its commander before seizing power in the military coup of January 1971 deposing Milton Obote. He later promoted himself to Field Marshal while he was the head of state. Amin's rule was characterized by human rights abuses, political repression, ethnic persecution, extrajudicial killings, nepotism, corruption, and gross economic mismanagement. The number of people killed as a result of his regime is estimated by international observers and human rights groups to range from 100,000 to 500,000. During his years in power, Amin shifted in allegiance from being a pro-Western ruler enjoying considerable Israeli support to being backed by Libya's Muammar Gaddafi, the Soviet Union, and East Germany. In 1975, Amin became the chairman of the Organization of African Unity. Or, a pan-Africanist group designed to promote solidarity of the African states. 6. During the 1977-1979 period, Uganda was a member of the United Nations Commission on Human Rights. In 1977, when Britain broke diplomatic relations with Uganda, Amin declared he had defeated the British and added CBE, for conqueror of the British Empire. To his title. Radio Uganda then announced his entire title. His Excellency President for Life, Field Marshal Al Haji Dr. Idamin Dada, VC, DSO, MC, CBE. Dissent within Uganda and Amin's attempt to annex the Kajura province of Tanzania in 1978 led to the Uganda Tanzania War and the demise of his eight year regime, leading Amin to flee into exile to Libya and Saudi Arabia where he lived until his death on 16 August 2003. Amin never wrote an autobiography nor did he authorize any official written account of his life, so there are discrepancies regarding when and where he was born. Most biographical sources hold that he was born in either Koboko or Kampala around 1925. Other unconfirmed sources state Amin's year of birth from as early as 1923 to as late as 1928. Amin's son Hussein has stated that his father was born in Kampala in 1928. According to Fred Goedko, a researcher at Makari University, Idamin was the son of Andreas Nabaya, 1889-1976. Nabaya, a member of the Kakwa ethnic group, converted from Roman Catholicism to Islam in 1910 and changed his name to Amin Dada. He named his firstborn son after himself. Abandoned by his father at a young age, Idamin grew up with his mother's family in a rural farming town in northwestern Uganda. Kwedko states that Amin's mother was a Sa'at. 1904-1970, an ethnic Lugabara and a traditional herbalist who treated members of Bugunda royalty, among others. Amin joined an Islamic school in Bombo in 1941. After a few years, he left school with nothing more than a fourth-grade English language education, and did odd jobs before being recruited to the army by a British colonial army officer. Amin joined the King's African Rifles, CAR of the British Colonial Army in 1946 as an assistant cook. He claimed he was forced to join the army during World War II and that he served in the Burma campaign, but records indicate he was first enlisted after the war was concluded. He was transferred to Kenya for infantry service as a private in 1947 and served in the 21st Car Infantry Battalion in Gilgil, Kenya until 1949. That year, his unit was deployed to northern Kenya to fight against Somali rebels in the Shifta War. In 1952 his brigade was deployed against the Mormor rebels in Kenya. He was promoted to corporal the same year, then to sergeant in 1953. In 1959, Amin was made a fanned, warrant officer, the highest rank possible for a black African in the colonial British army of that time. Amin returned to Uganda the same year and in 1961 he was promoted to lieutenant, 
becoming one of the first two Ugandans to become commissioned officers. He was assigned to quell the cattle rustling between Uganda's Karamajong and Kenya's Turkhana nomads. In 1962, following Uganda's independence from the United Kingdom, Amin was promoted to captain and then, in 1963, to major. He was appointed deputy commander of the army in 1964, and the following year to commander of the army. In 1970, he was promoted to commander of all the armed forces. Amin was an athlete during his time in both the British and Ugandan army. At 193 centimeters, 6 feet 4 in, tall and powerfully built. He was the Ugandan light heavyweight boxing champion from 1951 to 1960, as well as a swimmer. Idi Amin was also a formidable rugby forward, although one officer said of him, Idi Amin is a splendid type and a good, rugby, player, but virtually bone from the neck up, and needs things explained in words of one letter. In the 1950s, he played for Nile RFC. There is a frequently repeated urban myth that he was selected as a replacement by East Africa for their match against the 1955 British Lions. Armin, however, does not appear on the team photograph or on the official team list. Following conversations with a colleague in the British Army, Armin became a keen fan of Hayes Football Club, an affection that would remain for the rest of his life. Commander of the Army In 1965, Prime Minister Milton Obote and Armin were implicated in a deal to smuggle ivory and gold into Uganda from Zaire. The deal, as later alleged by General Nicholas Songa, an associate of the former Congolese leader Patrice Lumumba, was part of an arrangement to help troops opposed to the Congolese government trade ivory and gold for arms supplies secretly smuggled to them by Armin. In 1966, the Ugandan parliament demanded an investigation. Obote imposed a new constitution abolishing the ceremonial presidency held by Kabaka, King Mutasa II of Buganda, and declared himself executive president. He promoted Armin to colonel and army commander. Armin led an attack on the Kabaka's palace and forced Mutasa into exile to the United Kingdom where he remained until his death in 1969. Armin began recruiting members of Kakwa, Lugbara, South Sudanese, and other ethnic groups from the West Nile area bordering South Sudan. The South Sudanese had been residents in Uganda since the early 20th century, having come from South Sudan to serve the colonial army. Many African ethnic groups in northern Uganda inhabit both Uganda and South Sudan. Allegations persist that Armin's army consisted mainly of South Sudanese soldiers. Eventually a rift developed between Armin and Obote, exacerbated by the support Armin had built within the army by recruiting from the West Nile region, his involvement in operations to support the rebellion in southern Sudan and an attempt on Obote's life in 1969. In October 1970, Obote himself took control of the armed forces reducing Armin from his month's old post of commander of all the armed forces to that of commander of the army, having learned that Obote was planning to arrest him for misappropriating army funds. Armin seized power in a military coup on 25 January 1971, while Obote was attending a Commonwealth summit meeting in Singapore. Troops loyal to Armin sealed off Entbebi International Airport, the main airport and took Kampala. Soldiers surrounded Obote's residence and blocked major roads. A broadcast on Radio Uganda accused Obote's government of corruption and preferential treatment of the Lango region. Cheering crowds were reported in the streets of Kampala after the radio broadcast. Armin announced that he was a soldier, not a politician, and that the military government would remain only as a caretaker regime until new elections which would be announced when the situation was normalized. He promised to release all political prisoners. Armin gave former King, Kabaka, of Buganda and President, Sir Edward Mutasa, who had died in exile, a state funeral in April 1971, freed many political prisoners, and reiterated his promise to hold free and fair elections to return the country to democratic rule in the shortest period possible presidency. On 2 February 1971, one week after the coup, Amin declared himself President of Uganda, Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces, Army Chief of Staff, 
and Chief of Air Staff, he announced that he was suspending certain provisions of the Ugandan constitution and soon instituted an advisory defense council composed of military officers with himself as the chairman. Amin placed military tribunals above the system of civil law, appointed soldiers to top government posts and parastatal agencies, and informed the newly inducted civilian cabinet ministers that they would be subject to military discipline. Amin renamed the presidential lodge in Kampala from government house to the command post. He disbanded the General Service Unit GSU, an intelligence agency created by the previous government, and replaced it with a state research bureau. SRB. SRB headquarters at the Kampala suburb of Nakasero became the scene of torture and executions over the next few years. 28. Other agencies used to persecute dissenters included the military police and the public safety unit, PSU. Obo took refuge in Tanzania, having been offered sanctuary there by the Tanzanian president Julius Nyerere. Obo was soon joined by 20,000 Ugandan refugees fleeing Armin. The exiles attempted, and failed, to regain the country in 1972 through a poorly organized coup attempt. Persecution of ethnic and political groups Armin retaliated against the attempted invasion by Ugandan exiles in 1972 by purging the army of Obote supporters, predominantly those from the Akali and Lango ethnic groups. In July 1971, Lango and Akali soldiers were massacred in the Jinja and Mbarara barracks and by early 1972, some 5,000 Akali and Lango soldiers, and at least twice as many civilians, had disappeared. The victims soon came to include members of other ethnic groups, religious leaders, journalists, artists, senior bureaucrats, judges, lawyers, students and intellectuals, criminal suspects and foreign nationals. In this atmosphere of violence, many other people were killed for criminal motives or simply at will. Bodies were often dumped into the River Nile. The killings, motivated by ethnic, political, and financial factors, continued throughout Armin's eight-year reign. The exact number of people killed is unknown. The International Commission of Jurists estimated the death toll at no fewer than 80,000 and more likely around 300,000. An estimate compiled by exile organizations with the help of Amnesty International puts the number killed at 500,000. Among the most prominent people killed were Benedicto Kawanuka, the former Prime Minister and Chief Justice, Janani Loam, the Anglican Archbishop, Joseph Mubiru, the former governor of the Central Bank, Frank Lemuzo, the vice-chancellor of Makere University, Byron Kawadwa, a prominent playwright, and two of Armin's own cabinet ministers, Erina Wilson or Ima and Charles Obothofumbi. Armin recruited his followers from his own tribe, the Kakwas, along with South Sudanese. By 1977, these three groups formed 60% of the 22 top generals and 75% of the cabinet. Similarly, Muslims formed 80% and 87.5% of these groups even though they were only 5% of the population. This helps explain why Armin survived eight attempted coups. The army grew from 10,000 to 25,000 by 1978. Armin's army was largely a mercenary force. Half the soldiers were South Sudanese, 26% Congolese, only 24% were Ugandan mostly Muslim and Kakwa. We are determined to make the ordinary Ugandan master of his own destiny, and above all to see that he enjoys the wealth of his country. Our deliberate policy is to transfer the economic control of Uganda into the hands of Ugandans, for the first time in our country's history. It I mean on the persecution of minorities. In August 1972, Amin declared what he called an economic war a set of policies that included the expropriation of properties owned by Asians and Europeans. Uganda's 80,000 Asians were mostly from the Indian subcontinent and born in the country, their ancestors having come to Uganda when the country was still a British colony. Many owned businesses, including large-scale enterprises, which formed the backbone of the Ugandan economy. On 4 August 1972, Armin issued a decree ordering the expulsion of the 60,000 Asians who were not Ugandan citizens, most of them held British passports. This was later amended to include all 80,000 Asians, except for professionals, 
such as doctors, lawyers, and teachers, a plurality of the Asians with British passports, around 30,000, emigrated to the UK. Others went to Australia, Canada, India, Kenya, Pakistan, Sweden, Tanzania, and the US. Armin expropriated businesses and properties belonging to the Asians and handed them over to his supporters. The businesses were mismanaged and industries collapsed from lack of maintenance. This proved disastrous for the already declining economy. In 1977, Henry Kayemba, Armin's health minister and a former official of the first Obote regime, defected and resettled in the UK. Kayemba wrote and published A State of Blood, the first inside Iraq expose of Armin's rule. Following the expulsion of Ugandan Asians in 1972, most of whom were of Indian descent, India severed diplomatic relations with Uganda. The same year, as part of his economic war, Armin broke diplomatic ties with the UK and nationalised 85 British-owned businesses. That year, relations with Israel soured. Although Israel had previously supplied Uganda with arms, in 1972 Armin expelled Israeli military advisers and turned to Muammar Gaddafi of Libya and the Soviet Union for support. Armin became an outspoken critic of Israel. In return, Gaddafi gave financial aid to Armin. In the 1974 French-produced documentary film General Id Armin Dada, a self-portrait, Armin discussed his plans for war against Israel, using paratroops bombers and suicide squadrons. The Soviet Union became Armin's largest arms supplier. East Germany was involved in the General Service Unit and the State Research Bureau, the two agencies which were most notorious for terror. Later during the Ugandan invasion of Tanzania in 1979, East Germany attempted to remove evidence of its involvement with these agencies. In 1973, U.S. Ambassador Thomas Patrick Melady recommended that the United States reduce its presence in Uganda. Melady described Armin's regime as racist, erratic and unpredictable, brutal, inept, bellicose, irrational, ridiculous, and militaristic. Accordingly, the United States closed its embassy in Kampala. In June 1976, Armin allowed an Air France airliner from Tel Aviv to Paris hijacked by two members of the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, External Operations, BFLPEO, and two members of the German revolutionaire Zellen to land at Entbebe Airport. There the hijackers were joined by three more. Soon after, 156 non-Jewish hostages who did not hold Israeli passports were released and flown to safety, while 83 Jews and Israeli citizens as well as 20 others who refused to abandon them, among whom were the captain and crew of the hijacked Air France jet, continued to be held hostage. In the subsequent Israeli rescue operation, codenamed Operation Thunderbolt, popularly known as Operation Entbebe, on the night of 3 4 July 1976, a group of Israeli commandos were flown in from Israel and seized control of Entbebe airport, freeing nearly all the hostages. Three hostages died during the operation and ten were wounded, seven hijackers, about 45 Ugandan soldiers, and one Israeli soldier, Yoni Netanyahu, were killed. A fourth hostage, 75-year-old Dora Block, an elderly Jewish Englishwoman who had been taken to Milago Hospital in Kampala before the rescue operation was subsequently murdered in reprisal. The incident further soured Uganda's international relations, leading the United Kingdom to close its high commission in Uganda. Uganda under Amin embarked on a large military build-up, which raised concerns in Kenya. Early in June 1975, Kenyan officials impounded a large convoy of Soviet-made arms en route to Uganda at the port of Mombasa. Tension between Uganda and Kenya reached its climax in February 1976 when Amin announced that he would investigate the possibility that parts of southern Sudan and western and central Kenya, up to within 32 kilometers 20 miles, of Nairobi, were historically a part of colonial Uganda. The Kenyan government responded with a stern statement that Kenya would not part with a single inch of territory. Armin backed down after the Kenyan army deployed troops and armored personnel carriers along the Kenya-Uganda border. By 1978, the number of Armin's supporters and close associates had shrunk significantly, 
and he faced increasing dissent from the populace within Uganda as the economy and infrastructure collapsed from years of neglect and abuse. After the killings of Bishop Lewin and Ministers Oima and Obotho Fambi in 1977, several of Armin's ministers defected or fled into exile. In November 1978, after Armin's vice president, General Mustafa Adrasi, was injured in a car accident, Troops loyal to him mutinied. Amin sent troops against the mutineers, some of whom had fled across the Tanzanian border. Amin accused Tanzanian President Julius Nyerere of waging war against Uganda, ordered the invasion of Tanzanian territory, and formally annexed a section of the Kajara region across the boundary. In January 1979, Nyerere mobilized the Tanzania People's Defense Force and counterattacked joined by several groups of Ugandan exiles who had united as the Uganda National Liberation Army, UNLA. Amin's army retreated steadily, and, despite military help from Libya's Muammar Gaddafi, he was forced to flee into exile by helicopter on the 11th of April 1979, when Kampala was captured. He escaped first to Libya, where he stayed until 1980, and ultimately settled in Saudi Arabia where the Saudi royal family allowed him sanctuary and paid him a generous subsidy in return for his staying out of politics. Amin lived for a number of years on the top two floors of the Novotel Hotel on Palestine Road in Jeddah. Brian Barron, who covered the Uganda-Tanzania war for the BBC as chief Africa correspondent, together with cameraman Mohamed Amin of Viz News in Nairobi, located Armin in 1980 and secured the first interview with him since his deposition. During interviews he gave during his exile in Saudi Arabia, Armin held that Uganda needed him and never expressed remorse for the nature of his regime. In 1989, he attempted to return to Uganda, apparently to lead an armed group organized by Colonel Juma Oris. He reached Kinshasa, Zaire, now the Democratic Republic of the Congo before Zairean President Mobata says Siko forced him to return to Saudi Arabia. Death On 19 July 2003, one of Amin's wives, Madina, reported that he was in a coma and near death at the King Faisal Specialist Hospital and Research Center in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia, from kidney failure. She pleaded with the Ugandan president, Yari Musvini to allow him to return to Uganda for the remainder of his life. Musvini replied that Amin would have to answer for his sins the moment he was brought back. Amin's family decided to disconnect life support and Amin died at the hospital in Jeddah on 16 August 2003 and was buried in Uwais Cemetery in Jeddah in a simple grave without any fanfare. After Amin's death, David Owen revealed that when he was the British Foreign Secretary, he had proposed having Armin assassinated. He has defended this, arguing, I'm not ashamed of considering it, because his regime goes down in the scale of Pol Pot as one of the worst of all African regimes. A polygamist, Idamin married at least five women, three of whom he divorced. He married his first and second wives, Malyamu and Kay, in 1966. The next year, he married Nora and then married Nalonga Madina in 1972. On 26 March 1974, he announced on Radio Uganda that he had divorced Maliamu, Nora and Kay. Maliamu was arrested in Tarora on the Kenyan border in April 1974 and accused of attempting to smuggle a bolt of fabric into Kenya. She later moved to London where she operates a restaurant in East London. Kay Amin died under mysterious circumstances in the mid-70s and her body was found dismembered. Nora first fled to Dr. Congo in 1979 but her current whereabouts are unknown. In August 1975, during the Organization of African Unity or, summit meeting in Kampala, Amin married Sarah Kulaba, who was famously known as Suicide Sarah. Sarah's boyfriend, with whom she had been living before she met Amin, vanished and was never heard from again. By 1993, Amin was living with the last nine of his children and a single wife, Mama Achyumaru, who appears to be his sixth and newest wife the mother of the youngest four of his children. His last known child, daughter Ayman, was born in 1992. According to the Monitor, Amin married a few months before his death in 2003. Sources differ widely on the number of children Amin fathered, 
most say that he had 30 to 45, until 2003, to Ben Armin, born 1955, Armin's eldest son, was the leader of West Nile Bank Front, WNBF, a rebel group opposed to the government of Yari Museveni. In 2005, he was offered amnesty by Museveni, and in 2006, he was appointed Deputy Director General of the Internal Security Organization. Another of Amin's sons, Haji Ali Amin, ran for election as chairman, that is mayor, of Njoyu Town Council in 2002 but was not elected. In early 2007, the award-winning film The Last King of Scotland prompted one of his sons, Jaffa Amin, born in 1967, to speak out in his father's defense. Jaffa Amin said he was writing a book to rehabilitate his father's reputation. Jaffa is the tenth of Amin's forty official children by seven official wives. On 3 August 2007, Faisal Wang Ita, born in 1983, one of Amin's sons, was convicted for playing a role in a murder in London. Wang Ita's mother is Amin's fifth wife, Sarah Kulaba, born 1955 a former go-go dancer, but known as Suicide Sarah, because she was a go-go dancer for the Ugandan Army's Revolutionary Suicide Mechanized Regiment Band. Among Armin's closest associates was the British-born Bob Astles, who is considered by many to have been a malignant influence and by others as having been a moderating presence. Isaac Maliamung who was an instrumental affiliate and one of the more feared officers in Armin's army. Armin's egotistical behavior and mental health have been the subjects of much speculation throughout his reign and life. He was described as having a quick change and violent short temper, being charming, happy, and charismatic one minute and then suddenly angry, violent and brutal the next with little or no warning. May have speculated his behavior was either the result of long-term syphilis of the brain or possibly undiagnosed and untreated bipolar disorder. Citation needed, as the years progressed, Armin's behavior became more erratic, unpredictable, and outspoken. After the United Kingdom broke off all diplomatic relations with his regime in 1977. Armin declared he had defeated the British and conferred on himself the decoration of CBE, conqueror of the British Empire. His full self-bestowed title ultimately became His Excellency, President for Life, Field Marshal Al Haji Dr. Amin Dada, VC, DSO, MC, Lord of all the beasts of the earth and fishes of the seas and conqueror of the British Empire in Africa in general and Uganda in particular. In addition to his officially stated claim of being the uncrowned King of Scotland, he was not a recipient of a Distinguished Service Order, DSO, or a Military Cross, MC. He conferred a Doctorate of Law on himself from Makerere University as well as the Victorious Cross, VC, a medal made to emulate the British Victoria Cross. Armin became the subject of rumors and myths, including a widespread belief that he was a cannibal. 70. Some of the unsubstantiated rumors, such as the mutilation of one of his wives, were spread and popularized by the 1980 film Rise and Fall of Idamin and alluded to in the film The Last King of Scotland in 2006, a movie which earned actor Forrest Whitaker an Academy Award for Best Actor for his portrayal of Armin. During Armin's time in power, popular media outside of Uganda often portrayed him as an essentially comic and eccentric figure. In a 1977 assessment typical of the time, a Time magazine article described him as a killer and clown, big-hearted buffoon and strutting martinet. The comedy variety series Saturday Night Live aired four Armin sketches between 1976 to 79, including one in which he was an ill-behaved house squist in exile and another in which he was a spokesman against venereal disease. The foreign media were often criticized by Ugandan exiles and defectors for emphasizing Armin's self-aggrandizing eccentricities and taste for excess, and downplaying or excusing his murderous behavior. Other commentators even suggested that Armin had deliberately cultivated his eccentric reputation in the foreign media as an easily parodied buffoon in order to diffuse international concern over his administration of Uganda.